have reading again the scripture passage. The scripture says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. This is where we left off in the last session. Um, and so we're picking up here to move on forward in our outline with this. This particular passage actually highlights four specific elements to a person's ministry in the Word of God. And I believe this is really essential for us as we're preparing to be great preachers and teachers. Amen. Um, the first one is, is that we have to be diligent. Uh, diligent is the opposite of being slothful. Diligent is taking seriously ahead of time and setting some goals and some standards that we want to achieve before we go in to minister. And that means anything, not just preaching, but anything we do. Even if you're going to the hospital to pray for someone, on your way there you want to be praying in the Spirit. You want to be meditating on what God would give you to encourage them with and how that you should minister and what you should do. So preparation is an, an ongoing, all the time part of ministry. But when it comes to speaking, preparation, it involves it involves applying ourselves. It involves getting, a, getting along with God and then getting into your uh, study books, getting into your software, getting into your Bible, and presenting the best message that you can. It also involves doing it structurally correct. It involves doing it uh, according to the things that we'll be teaching you this month uh, from a homiletical perspective so that the listener can receive the, the utmost from your message and be blessed with it. Amen. So we have to be diligent. It basically means to exert ourselves with earnest diligence. Other translations use the term study, earnestly endeavor, do your best, work hard. So I think this communicates the idea that preaching is not easy. Preaching is not something we take lightheartedly. Uh, we don't just step on a platform and just tell people what's on the top of our mind. Amen. Not to say that occasionally God doesn't give us something by the Spirit. The gifts don't operate through us and we deliver those messages. But I believe firmly that we must accept the fact that the Holy Spirit knows what's going to be needed in an upcoming service or meeting. And that he can speak to you through your study. He can speak to you in your prayer time. He can help you put together the message that will be divinely uh, appointed and assigned for that moment in advance. I've had people tell me, well, you know, brother, you just prepared that. That's all you. And how can God use that? No, I believe the Holy Spirit meets with me in my study time. I believe he meets with me in the Word. He meets with me in prayer. I believe he knows what's happening in the lives of the people throughout the week or throughout the month. And I believe that he strategically gives me a word for them every time I step up to speak that that moment in history will never transpire again. Those people will never be there again. At that time, I'll never be there again. God has chosen to use me and he's chosen to speak to them. This is all in the divine providence of God. And I believe that God has already prepared me and given me a word and a message. And because I have given diligence to it, it's going to be powerful and it's going to reach and touch their hearts and their lives. Amen. Because he will anoint um, my faith that I have offered to him through my works. Uh, amen. So uh, we have to do it to please and to be approved by God. Sometimes we get in a trap of preaching because we want the approval of people. We have to avoid this. Amen. Uh, this is a real dangerous trap because it plays on our ego. But it's God's word and it's God's people that we're speaking to. And so we have to remain humble and always trust in the fact that God uh, is the one who we're exalting and the one who we're communicating his word to the people in the needs of their lives. Here's some other translations that say this. Earnestly seek to commend yourself to God. Another one says, try hard to show yourself worthy of God's approval. Amen. I'm not trying to impress people. I'm trying to find the favor of the Lord by doing what he has given me to do. Um, Knox said, aim first at winning God's approval. Uh, the NLT says, work hard so God can approve you. Uh, I think that's really good. Amen. Concentrate on doing your best for God, the message says. So we need to be willing to do the work that is required of us. Amen. When it comes to uh, the Word of God, we need to see ourselves as workers. This is our livelihood. This is our ministry. It's our calling. Paul speaks of laboring in the Word and doctrine in 1 Timothy 5.17. And we need to get good at this. We don't need to just get by. We need to get good. I have a pastor friend that always used to say, 
I don't believe, he always would say, I don't believe God wants me to be better than everybody else. He said, I just believe God wants me to be the best that I can be. And I believe that's exactly what God would say to all of us, is that we need to work hard to be the best that we can be in delivering his word. If I truly honor and reverence his word, if I hold his word high as I should, then I should put everything I have into the preparation and the delivery of that word because I want every single syllable to touch hearts and to change lives. Amen. Amen. Uh, we don't want to be grabbing the quickest sermon. We don't want to be just downloading something off the internet on Sunday morning before church. But we want to be able to have a divine word from God. We want people to walk away and say, you know, Pastor uh, has been with Jesus. Amen. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Amen. So the scripture is referring to um, us as people who involve ourselves in labor. In this passage, it literally means to feel fatigue. And this is not casual work. If you uh, have a passion and a love for the Word of God, like I do, you'll find yourself sometimes just pressing further, pressing further, pressing further, because the Word just keeps unfolding and opening up as the Holy Spirit anoints it and, and uh, enlightens it. And it's like you just you don't know where to stop. You don't know where to or to turn it off and you can find yourself just exhausted physically but inside your spirit you're so alive and you're so ready to share it and to bless God's people amen amen uh, Acts 6 4 says but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word God expects those of us who bring the word to spend time in that word amen and he provides uh, other people to do other aspects of ministry so that you can have the time and the freedom to do it. I understand a lot of you are bivocational. Some of you are like the first 10, 15 years of my life in the ministry. I pastored full time and I worked full time. And then someone would say, oh, then you, you mean you pastored half, a part time? No, 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 there's no such thing as a part time pastor. Uh, if you're the pastor, you're full time, amen. <laughs> amen. So we have to rightly divide the word. Uh, we need to be accurate in the use of the Word. The Word of God is not there for us to prove our own point or, or establish our own uh, view of things. The Word of God is there to establish people in the pure doctrine of God. Uh, to rightly divide means to cut straight. Other translations state it like this. Uh, ever cutting a straight path for the message of truth. The NEB says driving a straight furrow in your proclamation of truth. Uh, another one says, rightly laying out the word of truth. And yet another one, correctly analyzing the message of truth. And then skillfully handling the word. Uh, another one says, accurate in delivering the message of truth. And yet another one, declaring the word of truth without distortion. That's a good one, amen. Uh, and then the message says, laying out the truth, plain and simple, amen. Uh, praise the Lord. The Amplified says it, reads this passage, or says it this way. Study and be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing. That means rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You know what I found out? That uh, as God gives me word, the word and things to preach, he's speaking to me first. He, he wants me to apply it to my life first. And I, I'm a, I am so often tested by the words of my mouth, by the very thing I preach or teach. It, it has to be applied in my life. And so God wants us to be more than just uh, some channel that he flows through. But he wants us to be transformed with the word as the people are transformed by the word. Amen. Uh, preachers and teachers, pastors and speakers on behalf of God are not people who are perfect or have it all together. And we should never look at ourselves that way. That's very prideful. We should be humble and we should realize that we too are sheep. And we too need that fresh uh, pasture, that good word. We need to apply it to our lives. We're not preaching what the people need. God's speaking to us about what we all need. Amen. And when that becomes the basis for how I minister, then I'm able to speak with 
authority, but I'm also able to speak humbly so that the Word is working mightily in me as He works in the people. And the people will respect that, amen? And they'll be more apt to receive that, praise God. So we want to rightly divide the Word of God because if we don't, we're going to sooner or later end up to be ashamed, amen? The second one here is rightly dividing means making study uh, making study a major priority in the pastor's schedule. It's like anything you do. If we don't make time for it, if we don't plan it, then we probably are going to fail to do it all the time like we should. And so uh, the pastor should have a balance in, in visiting people, serving tables, doing all the things they do, and in their time they spend in the Word and in prayer. Um, uh, and I know sometimes our churches can be demanding. Our people can have a wrong perception because of tradition about what our role is. But in fact, our role, according to Ephesians 11, uh, 11 through 16, is, is that we're to be there to equip. We're, we're to be there to train the people to actually do the work of the ministry, the, the hands-on uh, serving and, and uh, caring for one another, amen, so that we can spend time and hear from God on behalf of uh, uh, their needs and what where they're at, and then present the words of life to them, amen. Um, so, uh, rightly dividing means doing the work of research. Uh, God expects us to spend some time searching and seeking. As a matter of fact, listen to what Proverbs 25 2 says it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Uh, all right, kings, let's go, let's get in the word, and let's find out what God has to say about. Uh, this situation in, in our lives and in our church and in our community. God has a word for you to deliver to the people. He has a message that he wants to communicate to the community that you represent and that you are, are speaking to. You are God's voice to your people uh, and to your community as far as vision and direction goes. God wants to use you to communicate to them what he wants corporately to be accomplished and done as well as what he wants to do to touch the minister in their personal lives. This passage or this verse actually means learning the right way to study the Bible. It includes word studies, character studies, topical studies. We should be doing all these things throughout the week. Uh, we have to prepare for our specific times we preach and teach and minister. But we need to get familiar with the Bible. We need to get familiar with Scripture. We need to know the background of the authors. We need to know who they were speaking to and what was the culture of the author and what was the culture of the people he was addressing. We need to understand the timing and the things that were going on in that community or city as they were being spoken to in the Word by the author. We need to understand that all of these things play into the, the proper interpretation of the Word of God and that as, as we come to homiletically deliver the Word, we want to be sure that we have herm hermeneutically uh, presented it correctly. Amen? Uh, we need to learn how to use the best tools for digging in there and discovering and seeking and accumulating uh, helpful resources. We need to build a good library and have some resource books. Amen? Uh, it means studying and doing the work yourself. You, you and I should never just repeat what we've heard somebody else say. I, I notice this is real common. A lot of people just read what the prophets are saying and repeat it. Some people will um, uh, uh, listen to their favorite preacher and take an outline and that's the message they bring every week. And I'm not saying that God can't use those things at times and sometimes he won't direct you to do that. But he wants you to invest in it so that he has a part in your life and so that the word of God comes out of your life and not just out of your mouth only. See, Amen? Um, so it means battling the natural spirit of laziness. We're all tempted at times to want to just uh, just throw everything off and take a break. And rest is important. And, and getting away sometimes and renewing your mind and, uh, just in a peaceful place with the Lord is important. But a spirit of laziness always wants to maximize uh, results for minimum effort. And too often, however, the results end up being the minimum. And we want to always do our best. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12, uh, indicates to us that we're to overcome this natural weariness uh, of much study. It means having a designated place for a private study. This should be private so that uh, you'll have minimal interruptions. It means having a set time to study. Uh, the more you can or organize your life in set routines, the better prepared you'll be 
for effective ministry. I can tell you that the times that uh, <clears throat> I minister in the Word, that I'll have a, a wonderful outline and I'll be presenting everything God gave me, but out of the abundance or the overflow of my time with God and my time in studying and, and uh, attempting to understand who Bible characters are and, and the background of, of lives and all these different things about the Bible, it just begins to flow out and it, it adds to the message that we're speaking, amen? But if, if there's nothing in there, there's nothing to come out, amen? Uh, proper feeding means understanding the place and the power of the Word of God in the lives of people. God's attitude about His Word is very, very interesting and it's very, very sincere. Psalms 138.2 says He magnifies His Word above His name. Hebrews 4.12 says His Word is alive and powerful and active and it's sharp. Amen. Isaiah 55.11 says the Word does not return void. And then Mark 16.15-20 he backs up his word with signs following. Uh, we, we ought to all memorize these points right here and just recite them to ourselves every time we're going toward a podium so that we're reminded, amen, of the authority and the power in this word that we're about to speak. There's an eightfold ministry of the word found in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. And it indicates to us that it, the word of God is, is for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, convincing, rebuke, exhortation, and comfort. So this gives us a pattern of the types of uh, approach or uh, direction that we go with the Word of God. It is effective in all these areas. Our attitude toward the Word of God should be one of hungering and desiring the Word ourselves. Uh, we should have an attitude that we are ourselves teachable. Amen. We should also be humble, and we also have, should have an attitude of obedience or personal application of the Word. I should live and then preach. I should not be preaching something I'm not living. Amen. I've known, I'll give you an example. I've known a lot of pastors. I've been in the ministry 40 years. I've known a lot of pastors who somewhere of course, along the course in our relationship finally would somehow uh, indicate to me that, that, oh, they don't tithe because they're in the ministry. They don't tithe because they're God's man or God's woman. They don't tithe because uh, people are supposed to tithe to them. Well, I want to tell you something. You're a sheep first. You are responsible for this very same, um, the very same principles laid out in God's Word as anybody else says. And you're going to have trouble getting people to do what you're not willing to do. before we call others to obedience. We need to realize that what we sow, we reap. Sometimes ministry struggle if we're trying to get people to do what we're not willing to do. Amen? Uh, proper feeding means, means having a healthy diet. And a healthy diet is balanced. It's, it, it, has, it has the right portions of the right ingredients. Amen? Um, Psalm 78, 70 through 72 says, He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So this word integrity means integrity. It deals with the heart motivation that must be behind the ministry of the word. The word skillfulness means proficient, excellent, and effective. So we're called to do things right. Amen. Uh, it means ministering to the whole man. Uh, Psalms 23 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not so the flock do, do not lack in any area of food. That means dispensing both knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah three fifteen said, And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Wow. Praise the Lord. Uh, the greatest diet, the greatest food you can bring to the people is the living Word of God. Amen. People today are always pr promoting uh, eat live food, eat vegetables raw because they're still alive and they're healthy for your body. Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, there's nothing wor worse than an old dead sermon. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing worse than something that's been uh, uh, regurgitated and and, <laughs> and represented over and over again to the point that there's no life in it. We want to give people the fresh word 
We want to give them living bread. Amen. Praise God. Uh, we want to maintain uh, the proper tension between extremes. We, there was balance. What are these two extremes? The extremes are mercy and the extremes are grace. Amen. So we have to keep these things together. Actually, the Psalms 85 10 says it. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. So there's that balance. And so we, we want to get the balance between uh, mercy and truth. Amen. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about divine sovereignty versus human responsibility. Yes, God is a supernatural God, but he also expects us to obey him and to do our part. Amen. James said, faith without works is dead. Well, if you want to be good in the ministry, God's going to do the majority, but he expects you to put forth that effort. Amen. And prepare yourself and apply yourself. What about law and grace? Amen. Faith and works, gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, authority and personal freedom, prosperity and self-denial. These are all things that must be balanced and they must be taught our people so that the people know how to balance. Uh, we've seen all kinds of misuses of, of many of these principles we just mentioned. Uh, right now that different uh, ministers and different movements get off balance in one area and then sometimes you'll see them swing all the way back the other side too far that way. We need to find the center. Amen. Where Christ is balanced and where it's all there. Healthy diet focuses on practical principles. In Exodus 18 through 20, the scripture said, And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Amen. That's Moses speak, uh, being spoken to by his father in law, Jethro. And specifically, he indicates here that there are three areas to public ministry. Those are teaching the statutes of the Lord, teaching them the way to walk or how to apply the statutes, and teaching them the work that they're to do. This is our primary thing. It's called feeding and leading. Amen. So does our ministry, you can ask yourself, does your ministry do this with the Word of God? Amen. Is it really equipping people for life? Amen. Uh, the NLT uh, uh, says uh, Exodus uh, 18.20 this way. You should tell them God's decisions. Teach them God's laws and instructions and show them how to conduct their lives. Amen. That's good. So a healthy diet never forsakes the foundation stones of Christian life, which includes a multitude of basic things, but they're primary and foundational. They are the cross of Christ, repentance, forgiveness of sins, just to mention some, faith, first love, and we can go on. The fact is, is that we need to lay out some direction and instruction for ourselves so that we will cover the basis over a period of six months or a year or however long you feel led to do it. These are important issues and things, amen. A healthy diet is one that ministers meat in due season. Acts 20, 20 and 27 says that I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. For I have not shunned to deliver you the whole counsel of God. So in order to do this, we need to evaluate the growth level of our congregation, our flock. We want to evaluate the strategic season that our church is in at that time. What's God saying? What's he doing right now? We want to evaluate the emphasis of our teaching over the last few months and even years. And we want to evaluate the specific areas of weakness in the congregation or the culture that we live in. Amen. So on the basis of your evaluation, then you plan your word ministry to address the needs of the congregation. As a pastor, you should be working ahead about six months uh, in your spirit. That doesn't mean that you have to have it all laid out, but it means that in your spirit, you're praying about it. You're beginning to hear from God. You're beginning to strategically identify and recognize where we are, where we need to be, and always try to be a little ahead of yourself. So that when, as you're approaching, you're moving progressively in a direction. Bring the word of God, deliver the word, include your foundational proofs and trends, uh, foundational um, scriptures and, and doctrine. But at the same time, relate the now word that applies to today, but also taking them toward the future so that you're building line upon line, here a little, there a little, amen, and instructing the people. P proper feeding 
uh, will necessitate the personal feeding of the pastor himself. That means we have to eat the word. We have to pray. We have to seek. We need to be also listening to some preaching and teaching, not so we can repeat it and preach it or teach it, but so that we're getting it spoken to our hearts and into our uh, uh, lives. Amen. Be careful that we're not just an echo. An echo is a repeating sound, an imitating of the words and the style of another person. Um, be, be your own man. Be your own woman. Preach the word as God is speaking it to you. I can tell you times of when everybody, it seemed like, was preaching one direction, and I felt like I was this long character out here, preaching a whole different direction. I, I can tell you this, approaching Y2K, Everybody was preaching. Jesus is coming back. The end of the world is here. And they were all on the end times things. And I felt so uh, intimidated. I even had, I was on television back then. I even had people uh, uh, commenting that I, I was off base and I was missing it. Because I'm still preaching, no, it's not time yet. We're not ready yet. I was preaching, it's time right now to trust the Lord. It's time right now to get in the Scripture and get in the Word. Everybody's on this bandwagon. And here we are in 2020. We're still here 20 years later. We're still establishing the church. We're still preaching and trying to get people grounded in the Word of God. A lot of people failed during that time. A lot of people got discouraged because they believed in a false hope. Listen, Jesus is coming back. He's returning for the church. But what we need to focus on now uh, is we need to focus on being the people we need to be in our community and setting lives of integrity and purpose and getting people working to win the loss so that at that moment in the twinkling of an eye when he does come to catch away the church, we're taking as many people with us as we can take with us. Amen. Amen. That includes, concludes this stuff.